So, I have been working for several years on problems of communication and control, whether in machines or in living organisms, on the new engineering and physiological techniques attaching to these notions, and on the study of the consequences of these techniques for the achievement of human purposes. There are at least three points in cybernetics which appear to me to be relevant to religious issues. One of these concerns machines which learn, one concerns machines which reproduce themselves, and one, the coordination of machine and man. I may say that such machines are known to exist. For example, a computer may play a game of checkers, and this computer will learn, or at least appears to learn, and it improves its game by its own experience. Learning <clears throat> is a property that we often attribute exclusively to self-conscious systems and almost always to living systems. It's a phenomenon that occurs in its most characteristic form in man and constitutes one of those attributes of man which is most easily put in conjunction with those aspects of man which are easily associated with religious life. Indeed, it's hard to see how any non-learning being can be concerned with religion. There is, however, another aspect of life which is naturally associated with religion. God is supposed to have made man in his own image, and the propagation of the race may also be interpreted as a function in which one living being makes another in its own image. In our desire to glorify God with respect to man and man with respect to matter, it's thus natural to assume that machines cannot make other machines in their own image. This is something that's associated with the sharp dichotomy of systems into living and non-living. And that, moreover, is associated with the other dichotomy between creator and creature. These two parts can be regarded as complementary to one and the other. The learning of the individual is a process that occurs in the life of the individual, in ontogeny. Biological reproduction is a phenomenon that occurs in the life of the race, in phylogeny. But the race learns even as the individual does. Darwinian natural selection is a kind of racial learning which operates within the conditions that are imposed by the reproduction of the individual. The third group of topics is also related to the problems of learning. It's concerned with the relations of machine to the living being, and with systems that involve elements of both kinds. As such, it involves considerations of a normative and more specifically of an ethical nature. It concerns some of the most important moral traps into which the present generation of human beings are likely to fall. It's also connected very closely with a great body of human tradition and human legend that concern magic and the like. In the field of science, it is perilous to run counter to the accepted tables of precedence. On no account is it permissible to mention living beings and machines in the same breath. Living beings are living beings in all their parts. While machines are made of metals and other unorganized substances with no fine structure relevant to their purposive or quasi-purposive function. I'm going to commence with the subject of learning. To begin with learning machines, an organized system may be said to be one which transforms a certain incoming message into an outgoing message, according to some principle of transformation. If this principle of transformation is subject to certain criterion of 
merit of the performance and if the method of transformation is adjusted so as to improve the performance of the system according to this same criterion, then it can be said to uh, learn. A very simple type of system with an easily interpreted criterion of uh, this kind of performance is the game. And a game which must be played according to certain fixed rules where the criterion of the performance is the successful winning of the game according to those rules. Now, among such games are games that have uh, a perfect theory, and these are not interesting. Tic-tac-toe is an example of such a game. We can not only theoretically find the best policy for playing the game, but that policy is known already in all of its details. The player of such a game, and either the first player or the second player, can easily win, or at least they can come to a draw by following this very self-same policy. In theory, any game can be brought to such a state, and this is the idea of the late John von Neumann. But once a game has been brought to this state, it loses all interest, and it can no longer need to be considered even as an amusement for us. Now, an omniscient being such as God would find chess and checkers to be examples of these kinds of von Neumann games. But as yet, their complete theory has not been humanly worked out. And still, they represent genuine contests, contests of insight and intelligence. However, they're not played according to the manner suggested in the von Neumann theory. And by that I mean, we don't play them by making the best possible move and then our opponent making the next best possible move and then we make the next best possible move and so on and so on. Well, until either one of us wins <coughs> or the game repeats itself. Indeed, to be able to play such a game in a von Neumann method is tantamount to possessing a complete theory of the game and to having reduced that game to a mere triviality. Can any creator, even a limited one, play a significant game with its own creature? In constructing machines which play games, an inventor will have arrogated to himself the function of a limited creator, whatever the nature of the game-playing device that he's constructed. And this, in particular, is true of game-playing machines that learn by experience. <coughs> Instead of functioning after the pattern of the von Neumann game theory, such machines act in a manner that are much more closely analogous to the proceeding of ordinary human game players. At each stage, they're subject to the constraints that restrict the choice of the next move to the one which is legal according to the rules of the game. And one of these moves must be selected according to some normative cr criterion of good play. Now, there's nothing to prevent a mechanized player from playing in a more intelligent way. And for this, they must keep a record of past games and past plays. Then, at the end of each game and each sequence of games of a predetermined kind of sort, the mechanism can be put to a very different sort of use. In this way, the figure of merit is continually being re-evaluated. And in such manner, it gives a higher figure of merit for configurations, configurations that chiefly are operating in the winning of those games. And it gives a much lower figure of merit for situations that are chiefly about losing games. The play will then continue until such a point as the game-playing machine transforms itself into a different machine in accordance with the history of the actual plays that it's made. Now in this, and the experience of success, both the machine and its human opponent play a role. In playing against such a machine, 
and this uh, absorbs part of its playing personality from its opponent, the playing personality must not be absolutely rigid. The opponent may find that stratagems which have worked in the past will fail to work in the future, and the machine may, in this way, develop what we might call an uncanny canniness. It may be said that all of this unexpected intelligence of the machine has been built into it by its designer and programmer. And this, in one sense, is true. But it need not be true that all of the new habits of the machine have been explicitly foreseen by the programmer. If this were the case, they would have no difficulty in defeating their own creation. In general, a game-playing machine may be used to secure the automatic performance of a function if the performance of this function is subject to a clear-cut, objective criterion of merit. In checkers and in chess, this merit consists in winning the game according to the accepted rules of permissible play. There may be great doubt as to how to win a game, but no doubt whatsoever as to whether it's been won or lost. The chief criterion as to whether a line of human effort can be embodied in a game is whether there is some objectively recognizable criterion of the merit of the performance of this effort. Otherwise, the game assumes the formlessness of the croquet game in Alice in Wonderland, where she plays with the queen of hearts who continually changes the rules. Under such circumstances as these, to win has no meaning, and a successful policy cannot be learned, because there's no criterion of success. Unquestionably, the technique of learning a game is certain to be employed in many fields of human effort that have not yet been subjected to it. War and business are conflicts that resemble games, and as such, they can be so formalized as to become versions of themselves. And these are perhaps already being established as models to determine the policies which will govern the push button that will burn the earth clean for a new and less humanly undependable order of things. Now, I wish to turn to the subject of reproduction. <clears throat> the learning to which we've been alluding to so far is the learning of the individual, and that occurs within the time course of an individual private life. But there is another type of learning which is of equal importance, and that's what I call phylogenic learning, or the learning in the history of the race. And it's this type of learning for which one type of basis has been laid down by Charles Darwin in his theory of natural selection. The basis of natural selection lies in three facts, heredity, variation, and selection. The first of these is that there is such a phenomenon as heredity. And by that, I mean an individual plant or animal produces offspring after its own image. Man makes man in his own image. And this seems to be the echo, or perhaps the prototype of the act of creation by which God is supposed to have made man in his image. Can something similar perhaps occur in even less complicated or perhaps more understandable case of non-living systems that we call machines? What is the image of a machine? Can this image, as it is embodied in one machine, bring another machine of a general sort but not yet committed to a particular and specific identity? Can it reproduce the original machine, either absolutely or under some change that may be construed as a variation? Can this new and varied machine then act itself as its own archetype, even as its own departures <coughs> depart from uh, an archetypal pattern. The second fact is that these offspring are not completely after their own image, 
but may differ from it also in ways that are subject to heredity. And this is the fact of variation. And it by no means implies the very doubtful inheritance of acquired characteristics. The third element of Darwinian evolution is selection. And this is the process by which the over-rich pattern of spontaneous variation is trimmed by the difference in the viability of different variations. Most of these tend to diminish the probability of the continued racial existence, although some, and perhaps very few, tend to increase it. By this, we mean that some forms are more successful at surviving and reproducing than other forms within a given environment. Now, in order to discuss the problem of a machine constructing another in its own image, we must take the notion of the image more precisely. And here we must be aware that there are images and images. In the ancient Greek myth, the sculptor Pygmalion made the statue of Galatea in the image of his ideal woman. But after the gods brought it to life, it became an image of his beloved in a much more real sense. It was no longer merely a pictorial image, but an operative image. Thus, beside pictorial images, we have operative images. These operative images, they perform functions of their original, which may or may not bear a pictorial likeness. Whether or not they do, they can replace the original in its action. And this is a much deeper similarity. It is from the standpoint of operative similarity that we shall study the possible reproduction of machines. But we may well ask, what is a machine? From one standpoint, we can consider a machine as a prime mover, a source of energy. For me, a machine is a device for converting incoming messages into outgoing messages. As the engineer would say in his jargon, a machine is a multiple input, multiple output transducer. This transducer, the machine, both as instrument and as message, thus suggests that a sort of duality which is so dear to the physicist, it's exemplified by the duality between wave and particle. Again, it suggests the biological alternation of generations, which is expressed by the, uh, the Bon Mo, and I don't remember whether it's Bernard Shaw's or Samuel Butler's, but that a hen is merely an egg's way of reproducing another egg. Thus, the machine may generate the message, and the message may generate another machine. When I've presented this discussion of self-multiplying systems to philosophers and biochemists, I've been met with the statement, but the two processes are entirely different. Any analogy between life and the non-living must be purely superficial. Certainly the detail of the process of biological multiplication is understood, but it has nothing to do with the process you invoke for the multiplication of machines. On the one hand, machines are made of iron and brass, and the finer chemical structure of which has nothing to do with its function as a machine. Living matter, however, is living right down to its finest parts that characterize it in the same sort of matter, the molecules. Now, it's certainly true to say that living matter has a fine structure which is more relevant to its function and to multiplication than the parts of a non-living machine. And this may not be the case for uh, newer machines which operate according to the new state of <clears throat> the new principles of solid state physics. But it is the idea that God's supposed creation of man and animals, the begetting of living beings to their own kind and the possible reproduction of machines are all part of the same order of phenomena. And this we may find emotionally disturbing. Just as Darwin's speculations on evolution and the descent of man were disturbing in their own time. If is it an offense against our self-pride to be compared to an ape? Well, we've pretty well got over it by now. 
However, it may well be an even greater offense to be compared to a machine. To each suggestion in its own age, there attaches something of the reprobation attached in earlier ages to the sin of sorcery or black magic. Finally, I want to speak about relations between machines and between living beings. Perhaps the powers of the age of the machine are not truly supernatural, but at least they seem beyond the ordinary course of nature to the man in the street. Perhaps we no longer interpret our duty as obliging us to devote these great powers to the glory of God, but it still seems improper to us to devote them to vain or selfish purposes. There is a sin which consists of using the magic of modern automatization to further personal profit or to let loose the apocalyptic terrors of nuclear warfare. If this sin is to have a name, let that name be sorcery. As long as automata can be made, whether in the metal or merely in principle, the study of their making and their theory is a legitimate phase of human curiosity. And human intelligence is indeed stultified when man sets fixed bounds on his curiosity. Yet there are aspects of the motives to automatization that go beyond a legitimate curiosity and are sinful in themselves. And these are to be exemplified by a particular type of engineer and organizer of engineering, which I shall designate by the name of gadget worshipper. In addition to the motive which the gadget worshipper finds for his admiration of the machine, is its freedom from human limitations of speed and accuracy. There is another motive which is harder to establish in any concrete sense, but which must play a very considerable role nonetheless. And this is the desire to avoid personal responsibility for a dangerous or a disastrous decision by placing the responsibility elsewhere, on chance, on human superiors and their policies which one cannot question, or on a mechanical device which one cannot fully understand but which has a presumed objectivity. It is this that leads to the issue of some blank cartridges among the ball cartridges furnished to a firing squad. This will unquestionably be the manner in which the official who pushes the button in the next and the last atomic war, whatever side he represents, this will be how he salves his conscience. It's an old trick in magic, one, however, which is rich in tragic consequences, to sacrifice to avow the first living creature that one sees after a safe return from a perilous undertaking. Once such a master becomes aware that some of the supposedly human functions of his slaves may be transferred to machines, he's delighted. At last, he's found a new subordinate, an efficient, subservient, dependable in action, never talking back, swift, not demanding a single thought of personal consideration. This type of mastermind is the mind of the sorcerer in the fullest sense of its word. To that sort of sorcerer, not only do the doctrines of the church give warning, but the accumulated common sense of humanity, as we've accumulated in, in legends, in myths, in the writings of conscious literary men. All of these, all of these insist that not only is sorcery a sin leading to the hell, but it's a personal peril in this life. It's a two-edged sword, and sooner or later it'll cut you deep. In one of the classics of the literature of horror, there's a tale called The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs. In it, an English family are sitting down to dinner in their kitchen. The son has left to work at his factory, and the old parents are listening to the tales of their guest, a sergeant major back from service in the Indian army. He tells them of Indian magic, and he shows them the dried monkey's paw, which he tells them is a talisman that has been endowed by an Indian holy man with the virtue of giving 
three wishes to each of three successive owners. This, he says, was to prove the folly of defying fate. The Sergeant Major says that he does not know what were the two first wishes of the first owner, but the last one was for death. He himself was the second owner, but his experiences are too terrible to relate. He is about to cast the poor onto the coal fire when his host retrieves it and despite his deepest entreaties, wishes for 200 pounds. Shortly thereafter, there's a knock at the door. A very solemn gentleman is there from the company which has employed his son. As gently as he can, he breaks the news that his son has been killed in an accident at the factory. Without recognizing any responsibility in the matter, the company offers its sympathy and 200 pounds as a consolation. The parents are distraught. At the mother's suggestion, they wish the son back again. By now it's dark outside, a dark, windy night. Again, there is a knocking at the door and somehow the parents know that it is their son, only not in the flesh. The story ends with the third wish, that the ghost should go away. Now the theme of all these tales is the danger of magic. And this seems to lie in the fact that the operation of magic is singularly literal minded. And that if it grants you anything, if it grants you anything at all, it's what you ask for, or what you intend. If you ask for 200 pounds, but you don't expli explicitly express the condition that you don't want it at the cost of your son's life, 200 pounds you will get whether your son lives or dies. Now, the magic of automation, and in particular the magic of an automatization in which the devices learn, may be expected to be similarly literal minded. If you're playing a game according to certain rules and you set the machine to play for victory, you'll get victory if you get anything at all. And the machine will not pay the slightest consideration to anything except winning the game by the rules. If you're playing a war game within a certain conventional interpretation of victory, Victory will be the goal at any cost, even that of the extermination of your own last side, unless the condition of survival is explicitly contained within the definition of victory according to which you program the machine. For many years, all armies have played war games, and these games have always been behind the times. It's been said that in every war, the good generals fight the last war, and the bad ones fight the war before that. That is, the rules of the war game never catch up with the facts of the real situation. And this has probably always been true, though in periods of much war, there's always been a body of seasoned warriors who have experienced war under conditions that have not varied much. These experienced men are the only real war experts in the true sense of the word. At present, there are no experts in atomic warfare. No men, that is, who have any experience of a conflict in which both sides have had atomic weapons at their disposal and use them. The destruction of our cities in an atomic war, the demoralization of our people, the hunger, the disease, the incidental destruction, which may well be greater than the number of deaths caused by the initial explosion and immediate fallout. These are only known by conjecture. The gadget-minded people often have the illusion that a highly automatized world will make smaller claims on human ingenuity than does the present one. And it will take over from us the need for difficult thinking, as a Roman slave who was also a Greek philosopher might have done for his master. This is palpably false. A goal-seeking mechanism will not necessarily seek our goals unless we design it for that explicit purpose. 
And in designing it, we must foresee all the steps of the process for which it's been designed. You know, instead of exercising a simple and tentative foresight, which only goes up to a certain point and has to be continued from that point on as new difficulties keep arising. The penalties for the errors of foresight, great as they are now, will be enormously increased as automatization becomes more fully into use. No. The future offers very little hope for those who expect that our new mechanical slaves will offer us a world in which we may rest from thinking. Help us they may, but at the cost of supreme demands upon our honesty and our intelligence. The world of the future will be an ever more demanding struggle against the limitations of our intelligence, not a comfortable hammock in which we can lie down and be waited upon by our robot slaves. Thus, one of the great future problems which we must face is that of the relation between man and machine, and of the functions which should properly be assigned to both those two agencies. On the surface, the machine has certain clear advantages. It is faster in its action, it's more uniform, and it can at least be made to have these properties if it's well designed. A digital computing machine may accomplish more in a day a body of work that would take the efforts of a human team computing for a year. And it will accomplish this work with a minimum of blots and blunders. On the other hand, the human being has certain non-negligible advantages. Apart from the fact that any sensible man would consider the purposes of man as paramount in the relations between man and machine. A machine is far less complicated than man and has far less scope in its variety of action. Now, chief among these advantages would seem to be the ability of our brain to handle vague ideas, as yet imperfectly defined. And in dealing with these, mechanical computers, or at least the mechanical computers of the present day, are very nearly incapable of programming themselves. Yet, in poems, in novels, in paintings, the brain seems to find itself able to work very well with material that any computer would have to reject as formless. Render unto man the things which are man's, and unto the computer the things which are the computer's. This would seem to be the intelligent policy to adopt when we employ men and computers together in common undertakings. It's a policy far removed from that of the gadget worshipper, and as far removed as it is, it's from the man who sees only blasphemy and degradation of man in the use of any mechanical adjuvants involving both. What we need now is an independent study of both human and mechanical elements. And this system should not be prejudiced either by a mechanical or an anti-mechanical bias. I think that such a study is underway and it will promise a much better comprehension of automatization. Thank you.